Hey y'all, so for those of you who don't know me, um, I'm Jack McGuire. Um, I'm a freshman at Notre Dame. Um, I did San Silviat at OLV from 6th and 9th grade. I've been mentor meteorology from 8th grade to my senior year of high school. Um, I've gotten two golds at States for meteorology. I gold at Solon Invitational as well. Um, yeah, so yeah. So this is my first time doing one of these Skype lectures, I guess. I'm not really sure how this is going to work. Um, so bear with me if there's any problems with editing quality. Plus it's like 10 p.m. and I'm currently in a hotel in Montana. So if somebody comes and gets mad at me, I'm sorry. So essentially how this is going to work is I'm just sort of going to talk through a lecture about tornadoes. And then y'all probably want to take notes. And then I'm going to have my mom give you a quiz afterwards, grades of which will be given to Miss Stevens. But I'm going to allow you to use your notes on the quiz. So if you just take your notes, that's fine. Um, and if you need me to slow down or anything, you could always just pause the video or go back and listen to something. And all the questions on the quiz will be from the lecture. Um, tornadoes. So that's how most people think of tornadoes. However, most of them don't actually touch the ground. And before I actually get going, just a little science will be a disclaimer. Um, you want to try to know this for your test, but also make sure to have a paragraph about tornadoes and a diagram of them on your cheat sheets, study notes, my bad. So first, um, right here is a diagram of a supercell thunderstorm. So a supercell thunderstorm is basically just a type of thunderstorm that forms from a low pressure system and just gets really, really strong. Um, and tornadoes typically occur in these or another type of storm called squall lines, which hopefully you've learned about both of these. But either way, I'm just gonna run through quickly about a supercell thunderstorm. So a supercell thunderstorm has a few main parts that affect tornadoes. A few of them is the updraft that goes to the middle, which hopefully I have a picture here that you can see. And then downdrafts go around the sides. And then also a thing at the bottom called a wall cloud, which hopefully I can point to here. I'm not exactly sure. Um, so this wall cloud is essentially what becomes the tornado. What you initially want to focus on is this little area of air that's going up and other air that's going down. So the air that's going up is called an updraft, and then air that goes down is called a downdraft, pretty self-explanatory. So the updraft is warm air that rises, and then the downdraft is cold air that sinks. It's just this one principle of everything that's warm air rises, cool air sinks. And so when this happens, when the warm air goes up and the cool air goes down, it's similar to like, y'all should have learned about the whole global circulation patterns too. And so when this occurs, the air starts to spin in a very similar way. And so as your hot air goes up, your cold air comes down, it starts to spin. Um, as this cold air sinks, it's eventually gonna keep going down and past where the warm air is starting to rise. And then it's gonna start to circle in, sort of like this. And then it's gonna start to keep going down. It's still gonna keep spinning. So this little funnel is what sort of forms from just this cold air that occurs. And then it starts to spin, and then that's how you start to form your funnel cloud. So this funnel cloud occurs when the little wall cloud, which is basically just an area of the cloud that sticks down from the supercell, when your downdraft starts hitting this, it starts circulating it and moving it downwards. It's sort of the funnel I just showed. And so that's going to cause your quote-unquote funnel cloud to form. And your funnel cloud is important because this is what's eventually going to become the tornado. This is what you can actually see. This cold air keeps on moving further and further down. It's going to keep pushing this cloud further and further down. And so eventually when it touches the ground, that's what's going to cause an official tornado to form. And then poof, your tornado is there. Um, and, that, and then as your tornado hits there, when all this air starts rushing down into one centralized spot, air is going to start to go back up, right? So that's why typically when you see a tornado and like Wizard of Oz and like how cows start flying around, that's how it occurs. Basically come down, they get picked up in the middle, and they just get blown around everywhere. And tornadoes actually do this, that's not just a myth. They actually do that, but they kind of have to be strong enough. And while they may be able to get cows, odds of them getting a house like in The Wizard of Oz, it's like you have to have at least an EF four or five, maybe a three, probably four or five, in order for this to occur. You're probably wondering what is this EF thing that I just mentioned. So the EF is called the Enhanced Fujita Scale. It's spelled enhanced and then F-U-J-I-T-A, Fujita. And this scale was put in place to basically rate how strong a tornado is, and it bases it off of the wind speed and the damage done. And so basically you can look at the path of a tornado, and if you have all the conditions for the EF scale, you can basically determine how strong the 
tornado was based on like did what vegetation got taken up or whether or not a house got taken up or a cow into the tornado and it also judges how far items were thrown so let's say let's say there's a tornado and it picks up a cow and it throws it 40 feet from where it originally was um, and the cow miraculously lives somehow so then you could use the distance of this cow to determine that this is an ef3 tornado um, you actually don't need to know how to actually determine tornadoes based off this skill you just sort of have to know that it exists and how it ha how it works, which basically that uses wind speed of the tornado and destruction. It works on a number system from zero to five, with zero being the weakest tornado and five being the strongest. So as I sort of explained earlier, an EF zero basically wouldn't really do any damage. You may throw around some leaves. With an EF one, maybe picking up a few trees or something. An EF two, maybe displacing a fence or something like that. EF three, picking up cows or car maybe something like that ef4 that when you actually see real home damage from the tornado itself and not from flying debris that ef5 that's where it's really dangerous and that's like if you remember the tuscaloosa tornadoes that occurred about six or seven years ago y'all may be too young to remember that but those were primarily ef5s uh, that happened there the skills is actually relatively new so it's just been in place in 2007 and it replaced the old skill called the fujita skill and the fujita skill basically was just based off of damage and it wasn't really in depth. And so it basically just say, okay, this is the damage path of the tornado. Hmm, I think it was an F2. And so that was one big issue with it is that it's super relative. And so I may see a tornado as an F2, but then like Tanner may see it as like an F5 or something like that. So that was a major issue with that skill. And that's why they sort of had to get rid of it for the EF skill, just because it's a lot more precise, but it's still somewhat like objective. And so the EF skill. So the wind speed is also really relative because it's not like you could throw a, like a machine into a tornado and go, whoa, this is the wind speed. Because that obviously would have worked because the machine would get destroyed and what's the, like, what are the odds I have a machine at the exact same time that a tornado occurs and then I can get close enough to throw the machine into the tornado. However, one thing they actually are looking at doing is using disposable drones. So basically the drone would fly very close to the tornado, but not actually in it. And then while the drone would get rocked, rocked around and it would get destroyed, if it could relay information for at least two to 10 seconds, then you'd have enough to actually determine wind speed. So that's actually a future use of the technology. Reiterate what we've done so far. So a tornado occurs when an updraft and a downdraft in a supercell thunderstorm become strong and push down and interact with the wall cloud, which then the wall cloud, if there's a strong enough downdraft, hits the ground, which then forms a tornado. And secondly, the enhanced Fujita scale is the primary mode of measuring tornadoes. It's kind of relative, but it's based off of wind speed and damage when just compared to the regular Fujita scale, which is just damage. So now on to one of the more important parts of this lecture, which is how to locate a tornado on a radar map, particularly Doppler radar. So this is all based on one key concept called a debris ball. So, in order, the first thing you want to do when locating your tornado is you first want to look for a typical supercell structure, which as you can see from this picture, this is what it typically looks like. And you see this little hook type shape at the bottom? This is called a hook echo. This is also very crucial for determining a tornado. And what you want to do when you see this, when you identify the supercell and you see the hook echo, is you want to look at the little solid part of the hook. I guess it looks more like a circle. And you want to look there to see if it changes color to a more intense color, like a purple or something like that. And that indicates something called a debris ball. So based on how Doppler radar works, which you all should already know, it basically sends waves and hits an object and then it bounces back. And so it can't actually tell what's rain or what's, for example, tanner flying in the air. And so in the case of a tornado, what occurs is this Doppler radar is sent out and it hits off of the debris, which may be a cow or maybe hobby air flying in the air. And then it bounces back to the radar and puts a signal of high intensity saying, hey, this thing is moving really fast and it's coming close because it's literally just circulating debris and it can't tell whether or not it's rain or not. But if you see this little debris ball in a hook echo, you can pretty much be guaranteed that there will be a tornado. And for now, the much, much more difficult part is identifying a tornado in a squall line. So as I briefly mentioned, a squall line can also hold a tornado, which you all should already know what a squall line is, but just in case, a squall line is literally just a straight line of storms. I don't really know how to do this whole camera reverse thing. So yeah, line of storms. 
And this typically occurs right behind a cold front. And so in these squall lines, it's basically just green on the outsides and then yellow and then red, and then there's gonna be some purple everywhere. So that's one of the issues when it comes to determining a tornado because there's gonna be purple. But typically you wanna look for, similar to the debris ball, you wanna look for isolated things of purple. But part of the issue with this is the rain could also be purple. You're not exactly sure. So you sort of have to more rely on different people reporting it in from the ground or from you seeing it through a camera or that sort of thing. And so squall line trails are typically identified using traffic cameras or something like that. So when looking at a squall line, you typically have to look at a different type of radar called a storm relative velocity radar. So this basically shows the direction to which objects are occurring with any object moving away from the radar being sort of like a reddish color and any object moving towards the radar being a greenish color. And so basically what you want to look for is, I see in this picture here, which is where you have a large area of either red or green with just spots of the opposite color in the middle of it. Because this indicates circulation. Because typically if there's wind blowing in one direction, right, it's all going to be one color because it's all moving either away from the radar or towards the radar. But if you get circulation and it goes and it spins, they're going to get in both directions. And so typically when you look at a squall line, you want to use one of these storm relative velocity maps, just reiterate storm relative velocity maps, to identify the direction the wind is moving, which helps you identify if there is a tornado. One issue with the storm relative velocity map, though, is that it only shows direction. And so it really just shows whether or not wind is moving in a circle. And so you can't actually be completely determined that there's a tornado at this location just because there's a spot of green and a giant thing of red. It could just be that there's just air circulating. As you know from like walking around OLV or something, sometimes you'll see little leaves get whipped up and be blown in a circle. And so if you did a storm relative velocity map of that, it would say that it's a tornado, which obviously that's not a tornado. So that's one of the major issues of this. That's one of the reasons why you sort of have to use both maps, your Doppler radar and your storm relative velocity, is because you want to see the circulation and this purple area, because then that shows that there's stuff moving really fast and that it's circulating. And so, yeah, if I had to take a guess, this is probably what you're going to be tested on at a state competition or something like that. And so what they'll do is they'll show you a map of a series of storms. And then they'll tell you to identify their tornadoes. And so you want to look for primarily these supercells with the hook echoes, with the debris balls. And if you can identify these, that's really the big picture here. Because that'll save you a lot of time when you take the test. And you could just have paragraphs on your cheat sheet study notes about tornadoes and how they form and stuff like that. Especially since you all get four, which is a complete ripoff. But yeah, so that's the main thing. So now on to the next topic of tornadoes, which are the different types of tornadoes. So one thing about tornadoes is that they are actually invisible. All you're seeing in a tornado is either the moisture from the clouds circulating or debris circulating or that sort of thing. But tornadoes can still occur without the cloud or anything like that. And so going back to the example of the leaves, do you know when you're outside and those leaves are spinning? You don't actually see the wind that's moving the leaves. You just see the leaves moving. But there's still circulation obviously occurring there. And so pretty much the different types of tornadoes are just based on what the tornado picks up. And so the first main one of these is called a water spout. You all have maybe have heard of these before. It's really just when a tornado forms over water and it picks up a bunch of the water from the ocean. So for example, the best movie of all time, without a doubt, is Sharknado. Fantastic movie. Just purely fantastic movie. This is a type of water spout actually that occurs because this tornado forms over water, picks up the sharks, and forms the sharknado. Just third one's the best, just throw that out there. Sorry about getting a little bit off topic there. Um, but yeah, so water spouts do occur pretty often, but they typically don't cause damage just because there's typically nothing to damage in the ocean. But they will pick up and throw fish. Um, which can actually kill some fish, but they're typically not even that strong because they don't get the same uh, pressure systems that you do when you're over land. And so they're typically not that big a deal. Really, the most damage they really do is maybe destroy some fishing boats. That's about it. 
So the next main type of tornado is called a dust devil. This one's also pretty self-explanatory. It's just when a tornado occurs over a really dry area and it picks up a lot of dust. And so you can go look at pictures of these online if you want. Um, and they're very similar to another type of tornado, which is called um, a steam devil, which is just the exact same thing except it picks up steam. But the final type of tornado, which is without a doubt my favorite, is called a fire whirl. It's when a tornado occurs over some sort of fire and then picks up and starts circulating fire. These are really cool. Um, here's a video of one right now. Creates the sea breeze and the onshore winds. So the winds now, I'm looking at the computer, are out of the west at eight miles per hour there in Carlsbad. So they've gone down. Now, look at what you're looking at right now. That's a fire whirl or a fire tornado. And that's what happens when these winds are radically changing. They start converging. And these fire patterns create their own weather out there, these thermals. Now, you see is rushing into that little fire tornado right there and then the heat and the warmth is carrying it straight up those are very dangerous you can have wind speeds in there over 150 miles per hour firefighters stay away from those paul firefighters stay away from those really that's all you have to say in response to that so yeah that's pretty cool and those are our main types of tornadoes and so the last thing i really wanted to go into was just sort of the life cycle of a tornado. It's actually not that hard. It's pretty self-explanatory. Um, the first step is called the formation, which as you can pretty much guess is the beginning of the tornado. And it's just when this updraft and the downdraft occurs and the downdraft eventually forces air down, which then starts to pinch in and starts to get the circular mo motion going. The next phase is called the mature phase which is just when it starts to gain more momentum, starts to gain more wind, starts to speed up, and when it eventually may or may not hit the ground. And then this would cause different debris to be picked up and thrown everywhere. And the last step is called the dissipation step. And this is really just when the tornado begins to weaken, it starts coming back up. And this typically occurs due to basically just the wind speed slowing down because of different changes in the environment. And yeah. So yeah, that's tornadoes essentially for you. Just to reiterate the main things, tornado occurs by circulating wind. It's measured by the enhanced Fujita scale, which is different than the Fujita scale and the fact that it uses wind speed. Um, there are different types of tornadoes, but tornadoes actually are invisible until they actually pick up something to throw. And then the life cycle, which is just three stages, formation, mature, and dissipating. Yeah, so that's about it. Um, so now my mom's going to be passing out the quiz to y'all. Um, if you have any questions, by the time you actually see this lecture, it should be close to, I think, 4.30 your time. I'm not exactly sure. And so if it's before 5 p.m. your time, um, I will still be on the ski slopes. But feel free to call me. I may not be able to answer immediately, but I will as soon as I get on a lift or something like that. If it's after about 5.15 when you finish this video, then I'll be free to call. And if you have any questions, feel free to call me. My mom has my number. Please just feel free to call me. Um, yeah, I uh, hope you enjoyed it. Um, good luck on the quiz and let me know how it goes.